We're delighted to have you here. It's Tuesday the 16th of December, which means uh, those of you who are so inclined have eight more shopping days till Christmas, which is a little ironic for me to say because I'm not much of a shopper. Not that uh, the stores would allow you to forget that you have eight more shopping days till Christmas. <coughs> so let's go ahead and get right to uh, the questions that we already have sent to us. <coughs> In fact, the first question is about giving gifts. How appropriate. How do you give a gift from your heart to a spouse, children, or if not married, to a girlfriend? I suppose this could be stretched out to pretty much anyone without making it a getting or a controlling behavior, um, which would not support um, conditional love for them. You know, most things require just conscious thought on our part. Uh, we can change just about anything in our lives by consciously thinking about it. So it's a matter of thinking before we give a gift to anybody. What do I expect here? Uh, that's what makes all the difference between a gift that is freely given, uh, which would make it an unconditional gift, um, and a gift that is not. What do I expect? It's all about expectations. If there are no expectations, then it's an unconditional gift, a gift given for the purpose of sharing real love. <coughs> So you ask, do I expect something in return? Um, do I expect some comment? Do I expect some appreciation? Do I expect some acceptance, some gratitude? Uh, do I expect a gift in return? It has got to be the most common thing on the planet that people exchange gifts at Christmas time. Um, I give you a gift, you give me a gift back. In fact, boy, Christmas time is just filled with resentments, isn't it? Um, I gave him a gift, but the gift he gave me back was cheap by comparison. And people sit around and they gossip about how they didn't get something from aunt so-and-so even though they gave her something. Uh, and on and on it goes. Well, if you gave somebody something and then you grouse about how you didn't get something as good back or you didn't get a thank you card or whatever, then it wasn't really a gift, was it? It was an investment. Um, it was a hook uh, to get back what it was that you were looking for. Uh, a true gift is simply freely given. It's just tossed out into the wind. And after that, you don't ever think of it again. And you have to decide if you really want to give a gift, can you do that? And, you know, if you can't do that, you need to think about it beforehand. You know, I suggest that you think about it some more and decide if you can change your attitude simply by thinking about it. Often we can, and then we can freely give the gift. If not, I suggest that you consider giving a lesser gift. For example, if you're going to give something expensive and you expect gratitude in return, think about giving something much less. Like, for example, if you're going to give an expensive gift and you expect something in return, consider sending simply a card um, or singing a Christmas carol or calling up and saying, hey, I was thinking of you. Because as we give less, we tend to expect less. So do whatever it takes so that you don't have expectations. Then, after you give something, note your attitude. After you've given it, then do you expect a comment, a gratitude, a respect, loyalty, appreciation, anything? Or can you completely walk away from it and forget about it? And if you can, then it was a gift. And if you can't, if you expect something, then simply tell the truth about it. You don't have to go to jail. Um, just find a friend and say, you know, um, I gave a gift to my brother, my 
wife, my whoever, and it turns out I wasn't as unconditionally loving as I thought. I expected something in return. And learn from the experience. That's all we really need to do. We don't need to be beaten about it. And you don't probably need to go and confess that to the person that you gave it to. <clears throat> do it with somebody else. Because let's say, for example, that you gave something to your brother and it turns out that you had expectations afterward. Probably it isn't going to work out well if you go tell your brother. Because if you go say to your brother, um, I have a confession to make. When I gave you the... Uh, car, you know, the, the um, new battery, uh, I expected you to be more grateful. <laughs> well, <laughs> then... <laughs> All you're going to do is generate <laughs> irritation because then he's going to feel obligated to express more gratitude to you. <laughs> so that's probably not the person to go describe that to. <clears throat> um, next subject. I was having a conversation with a woman that uh, I've been talking to uh, about uh, leaving a relationship that she had been having for some time with a man who um, is uh, empty and afraid and really just incapable of unconditionally loving her. But for some time, you know, she has been going back to him for a little of this and a little of that. You know, a little attention, a little conversation, a little hand-holding, a little advice, you know. Um, you know, little time together, you know, little walk in the park, you know. And, you know, each time she does, I just, you know, would sort of, you know, chuckle because she was just going back for a little imitation love. Um, on one occasion, you know, she would go to the same class, you know, just so she could be, you know, close to him. So that then he would walk her to the car. And she said, but, but I feel loved when uh, Fred walks me to the car. Um, and, you know, she was absolutely certain that she did um, feel loved. But, you know, is that the truth? And I said, no, you don't. You do not feel loved. What you feel is a little praise. You feel a little conditional acceptance. You feel a little excitement. You feel a little less empty. Uh, and she said, but, but... But, you know, he needs a little unconditional love in his life, too. And, and couldn't I do this real love work with him? Well, sure, you could. But picture yourself drowning. Um, and you want to get to shore. Everybody who's drowning does. Nobody wants to die. Do you want to save your life? Do, uh, do you want to get to shore with another drowning person or would you rather do it with somebody who comes along in a boat? I mean, the answer is kind of obvious, isn't it? And it was obvious to her. If you push hard enough on a passing drowning person, you can actually push them under the water and get your own head above water to get a single breath, maybe two maybe three, but it doesn't last long. And that was her experience with this guy, repeatedly. He would float by and she would push his head underwater and she'd get a breath, or two, or three, and she'd say that she felt better. Well, she did. She did feel better. The feeling is real. That's the problem with imitation love, is that the feelings of imitation love are real. There's no denying that. The feelings of sex, real. The feelings of praise, they're real. Um, feelings of power, real. But the happiness they produce is not real. And the, the emptiness, the, um, <clears throat> the filling up that they produce um, is very temporary. So sure, they're real feelings, but they do not produce real happiness. 
So that part's an illusion. Kind of like cotton candy. Uh, does cotton candy produce a real taste? Yes. But does it produce real nutrition? No. Here's somebody who writes and says, uh, my wife keeps bringing up things that I did in the past, like <coughs> years ago I was sick and she had to take care of me a lot and when I made some financial mistakes years ago. And, um, and I haven't defended myself. I admitted that I was a real burden when I was sick. I was demanding and I was insensitive. And I've thanked her for taking care of me during the time that I was sick. I admitted the financial mistakes that I've made. But she keeps bringing up those things, the times that I was a burden, the financial mistakes that I've made. And then she sulks and acts resentful toward me all the time, no matter how much I apologize for anything, and I don't know what to do. And this is a huge problem with victims. Victim is a terminal disease, and it has to be addressed. See, victims hold us permanently hostage in a place where we feel like we have to be forever apologizing because we really are wrong. They keep bringing up things where we're wrong. Well, okay, but how many times do you have to apologize for the past? Oh, I don't know, maybe twice. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Once should be enough, but I suppose in a pinch, maybe twice. Um, and see, victims succeed in getting people to back off because they keep bringing things up in such an insistent and self-righteous way. And you probably do. In fact, you do. You can tell from the way that you're talking here. So you've taken the first steps that you need to take, which involve telling the truth about yourself. You've done that. You know, you said, well, I'm wrong. You've admitted your mistakes. You've apologized. <clears throat> so let's deal with just one of the situations that you brought up, the time that you were sick. So you would say to her, for example, um, yes, um, I was sick. And you would say that yes, that you leaned on her. And yes, you certainly used her and failed to be sufficiently appreciative during the time that she took care of you. Um, in other words, you would take responsibility for all of that. But see, you've already done that. And that's not enough. It's not enough that you just simply take responsibility for what you've done because she keeps bringing it up. She's heard all that and it doesn't change anything for her. So it's pretty obvious that something else needs to be done. If we simply keep repeating the same behavior and nothing's changing, we need to do something else. <clears throat> her victimhood is destroying her and it's destroying your marriage. So, then you can say something else and should because it's killing her and it's killing you. So you might say something like this and I'm not telling you exactly what to say but, but, but it's obvious that you don't know what to say. So I'm just giving you some sample words and you tailor them, you know, kind of according to who you are um, and you'll figure out what to say, but I'm just giving you some an idea. You might say, for example, despite you know everything that I've said, it's obvious that you still resent me uh, for the time that I was sick. So, <clears throat> exactly what do you need? And this is you talking to her. Exactly what do you need to be over that? What do you need to be over the the injustice of that situation? Now. I can tell you, she won't have an answer to that. She'll be, well, I don't know, is what she'll say. So then you need to be prepared to continue. And you might say something like this. <clears throat> so, would it be enough if you, for example, cut off one of my fingers? Because see, she's looking for some kind of justice. Would it be enough if you cut off a toe or maybe poked out one of my eyes or cut off an ear or maybe drained two quarts of my blood. And then you need to continue and say, I'm not joking. What will it take? Because it's obvious that you want me to pay in some way for your suffering. So I'm really asking you, what will it take? I really want to know right now 
because you keep bringing this up to make me pay in some way for the injustice that I did to you. And I want to get the payment over with so that you can be happy. Now, you can't be angry when you say this. What you're trying to do is make a point to her that she will understand and in a way that she will never forget. Then you continue. You say, all I can do is tell you that I have made mistakes and all I can do is try to learn and grow. And that's all I can do. Now, as an aside to you, uh, you might say to her, and if you resent me for when I was sick, you know, it's obvious that you didn't really do all that you did uh, during that period for me anyway. Now, whether you add that or not, it's up to you. But it's pretty obvious that she wasn't doing it for you if she keeps bringing it up, that she was doing it for some, something to hold over you. But you need, then you need to continue and say to her, you need to understand uh, what I'm saying because your resentment is destroying your happiness and it's destroying our marriage. She has got to get this point because all you can do is learn and grow. That's all anybody can do. But they cannot go back and suffer and somehow in the process atone for their past mistakes. It just can't be done. But that's what she's requiring of you, requiring of you and it's impossible and it's ridiculous. So <clears throat> you've got to get this point across to her. And at some point, simply insist that she make a choice. Does she want to require that you pay for what you've done or does she want to be happy and move on and make choices that will lead to happiness? That's the choice because if she insists on you paying for what you've done in the past, she will ruin the rest of her life and she will ruin your marriage. And You've got to get that point across to her because this victimhood thing never stops. Victims never get enough blood. They never get enough of their pounds of flesh out of the people who they claim have hurt them because the irony is that people who claim to be victims never stop victimizing the people around them. It's hysterical. Well, it's actually not so funny, but it's ironic, shall we say. And that's something you need to get across to her. <coughs> A woman that I was talking to uh, recently, new subject, uh, said this to me. She said, uh, I've realized recently that not only have I not had real love my entire life, which is very common, but when it is offered, I avoid it. I'm afraid of it. And I've heard a lot of people say that, that they're afraid of being loved, which has some element of truth in it, but it's very incomplete. <clears throat> so I would say this. First, to her and to those who have said a, said a statement similar to that, with real love, what people are afraid of is being out of control. A life of imitation love is all about being in control. Imitation love is predictably traded. That's what we do with imitation love. We trade imitation love just like we trade commodities on the stock exchange. Uh, we pay for it with imitation love dollars. I'll give you praise, you give me power. I give you sex, you give me acceptance. I, we trade it. It's quantifiable. It's predictable. It's controllable. And you can't make people love you unconditionally. You're helpless in that regard. You can't make me love you unconditionally. You can only be yourself and then hope that people will love you unconditionally. And you know, if you've been trading an imitation love your whole life and it's been fairly predictable and fairly reliable, 
just putting yourself out there and telling the truth and hoping that people will love you unconditionally can be frightening. So that part can be a little bit scary. Second, <coughs> you're afraid of real love not being real. Uh, you've been looking for love your entire life, uh, especially lately, this particular woman who was talking to me, and if you've had imitation love fail your entire life, and here you are looking for real love, and then that fails, well then, then what? What hope would you have then? So the possibility of everything failing is frightening. And then third, you're afraid that if it really were real, if you did find real love, you're afraid that it would go away. Nobody is afraid <coughs> of actually being loved unconditionally. We're afraid that we'd be out of control. In other words, we might not get it. We're afraid that it won't be real. We're afraid that it might go away, you see. But these are all fears if we don't really get it and if it leaves us. So we're afraid that it might you know, leave. Uh, you know, what if somebody actually did love you? I mean, that would be just amazing, wouldn't it? Uh, you'd be in heaven, but then that creates a real problem because if somebody actually loves you and you find the coolest thing on the face of the earth, you would actually feel connected to that person. And now if you feel connected to that person and that person's giving you the greatest thing there is, the greatest feeling you've ever had, now if they leave you, they could really hurt you. So, gee, that's pretty scary. But notice, all of these fears are about what happens if real love isn't real or if it goes away or if we can't control it. But what we're ignoring is what if it is real and what if we can fill our whole lives with it. So with real love comes life. It's what life's all about. It's what makes life worth living. So, yeah, there's some risk, I suppose, in finding real love, but it's worth all the risks, is the point. Uh, and so, that's what faith is. That's, that, that's what faith's about, is laying aside all the fears and just getting naked and letting people get to know us to create the opportunities so that we can feel this thing that is worth all the risks. And giving people an opportunity to love us unconditionally so that we can experience the greatest feeling on the planet, which is to feel unconditionally loved, to feel loved without buying it, to feel that pearl of great price, to feel that love that surpasses all understanding. It's this thing that gives us the greatest peace in this life. So, mm, I understand the fears, but they're all worth it, considering the treasure that's on the other side of exercising the faith. <coughs> I got a, <coughs> a letter from a woman who, uh, who's writing about her biological son, and um, she shares the raising of her biological son with her partner. So her partner um, is this child's uh, parent, but is not the biological parent. She says, we have a 12-year-old son named Elijah. And um, at a recent family meeting, Elijah asked if he could trade cleaning the bathroom for someone else's chore because he didn't like the, the chore and feels it's time consuming. <coughs> we want to uh, take his preferences into consideration but also told him that we see value in doing chores that we may not like. Uh, we brought up the idea of everyone swapping chores every three months like you mentioned, thinking that he would uh, gain experience uh, at the mall, but he really didn't like that idea. 
we told him that uh, we would ask what your thoughts are on the chores and uh, go from there. Um, first decide what is reasonable in doing a chore. So, you know, you don't want to give a kid uh, a chore like, uh, you know, plowing 80 acres of ground uh, in two weeks. Uh, that might be, you know, unreasonable. <coughs> but cleaning the bathroom for a 12-year-old kid, ah, that's nothing. Um, so what you've, you know, assigned the kid is, you know, pretty easy. Uh, so you haven't made a mistake there. That's, that's just really easy, despite the fact First you decide, is it a reasonable chore? Which is absolutely unrelated to the amount of complaining that you hear about it. The fact that a child says, I really hate the chore and I think it's unreasonable is irrelevant. Um, and that's just kind of to be expected. Pretty much kids say, say that they hate every chore that is harder to do than a video game. <coughs> so if you hesitate, if the child, for example, says, oh, but I really hate this. This is just terrible. You're the worst parents in the world. This is like, this is like living in Auschwitz. If you hesitate the slightest bit and go, well, um, if you hesitate, then the child is absolutely convinced that he's right. So you can't hesitate. You have to make your decision clearly ahead of time and back off the zero. So, no hesitation. If you hesitate, which sounds like you've probably already done, then he gets the idea that he gets to be a victim. And if he does act like a victim, you have to stay absolutely upbeat and positive and sway zero. Uh, so, no hesitation. You encourage him. You say, I'm convinced that you can do this. No problem. Now, it is fine to rotate jobs. Um, and for example, and say to the child, um, you know, we can certainly rotate your job uh, in, and it has to be a good long period of time. <coughs> like say, we can certainly rotate your job in like four months. Um, and usually as the child gets older, it's, it's a good idea to rotate a, a, a child to a job that is increasingly difficult because that's kind of how life goes, you know, the older you get, the more responsible you become. Um, and, you know, my kids, by the time they were 12, my goodness, you know, this kid's cleaning a bathroom. Uh, by the time my kids were 12, I mean, they were taking care of huge plots of land, you know, an acre or more. <coughs> you know, I mean, they were planting trees and, uh, you know, one child was doing uh, all of the laundry for, see, seven kids and two adults. Um, they were doing major chores. So my kids would have considered um, cleaning the bathroom to be laughably simple. Um, we had kids who, whose job was cleaning the bathroom when they were four. So to be doing it at age 12 is um, pretty, pretty easy. You continue. Secondly, we've been holding brief family meetings at dinner. Um, where we're talking a bit about real love, but we homeschool <coughs> uh, Elijah and have made uh, real love and parenting part of his curriculum as we wanted to fill him in on what we're learning and why some of the changes are occurring. Uh, he really doesn't want to listen to the audio book, but we have required it of him and give him daily quizzes to ensure he's really listening to the book. Should we be teaching him real love in this way? He's slowly making changes of his own, such as admitting the truth about himself self, and talking about loving unconditionally. It's still blurry for us where Elijah should have a choice and where we make rules and tell him what to do and not to do. Um, it, it amazes me that parents ask where they have a right to make real love part of the curriculum in school or not. I mean, um, when kids go to, to uh, high school, for example, does the school feel the slightest bit squeamish? Do they say to the children, I don't know, should we get together and vote whether we have the right to impose algebra on your quick curriculum? No, they don't vote on it. Um, they make the kids take algebra. Why? Because they think it will be useful in their future uh, careers. And yet, or trigonometry. And yet, how many of us have 
ever used trigonometry after we've left school in our you know daily lives um, let me think in the last 10 years when was the last time I used trigonometry uh, zero times in the last 10 years and yet how many times in the last 10 hours have I used what I know about real love um, quite a few times do you get the point so in school we're required to learn all kinds of things about history um, algebra uh, grammar things that we very often never use again and yet we're squeamish about teaching them things about relationships which they'll use let's see mm, 10 times every day or more for the rest of their lives nah I wouldn't be too squeamish so yeah make it part of his curriculum and since you're doing the homeschooling you're the principal you shouldn't feel the least bit bashful about requiring its use um, our last question is tied to a situation in the past we've tried to control Elijah in many ways we're just learning how to love him and haven't mastered not wanting him to do things for our happiness he's understandably empty and in the past he's had lots of trouble in school completing work which is a large part of the reason we homeschool him a therapist once we once took him to said that he seems to be on emotional strike maybe not doing what everyone uh, wants him to do is a getting and protecting behavior maybe um, when he goes on strike and doesn't do what people want him to do it is a way of attacking people it can also be a little bit lazy on his part it's also a way of giving up um, you know be assured that pretty much every kid early in life tries to please people tries to earn praise tries to earn conditional approval but imitation love eventually wears off kids learn that no matter what they do it just doesn't make them happy anymore they don't get enough praise and so at some point kids give up earning approval and go for the power of saying up yours they discover that it's more predictable they can get that power mm, faster more predictably so he seems to resist anything unpleasant or time-consuming and currently he's been told to have the TV off and be in bed by 930 on weekdays if he's not up on his own and ready for the day shower breakfast and everything and down by 9 a.m. which by the way I think is pretty late but that's up to you he has 10 minutes of TV taken away for every minute that he's late interesting consequence that would be motivating you'd think yesterday he didn't have his alarm set and so he slept in so by 930 he'd already lost five hours of TV good motivation <coughs> we had to leave so I was forced to wake him up so he could leave with us and I informed him that he would pretty much lost TV for the day um, so what you do is with a child you graduate the consequences the the longer they don't do what they're supposed to do you keep increasing the consequences the problem is that if a child continues to sleep um, and they're completely unaware that their consequences are, incre are increasing he can sleep through losing five hours of TV and he's not aware that it's happening and so by the time he wakes up and he's lost five hours of TV now he's mad and discouraged do you see the problem so he's slept through the whole thing and he hasn't learned anything as the consequences were rolling up the only reason for a consequence is learning and so here's five hours of consequences rolling up but he wasn't learning anything from it so he just woke up to five hours of lost TV time see it didn't roll up steadily so he was learning anything he just woke up to it smacking him in the face so it didn't help him a whole lot so what you can do is you can sit down with him um, and you can say so what would you like to do so that you don't roll up five hours worth of lost TV time what can we do after you're 15 minutes late that will wake you up because we don't want the responsibility for waking you up frankly we don't want to have to baby you and I, and I gotta tell you nine o'clock is pretty late for a kid to be getting up it, that's I mean that's like being on vacation he just as well be in the Bahamas 
Um, but one thing that I would suggest is that consequences have to become increasingly uncomfortable. So like with our kids, if they said, well, but sometimes I just sleep in past my alarm and I couldn't help it. And I say, fine, but if you want me to help you get up, then it will be increasingly unpleasant. So do you have any suggestions? Always ask them first. And of course, they never do <coughs> because they always want it to be pleasant. Oh, we'd like you to come and massage our feet and get us out of bed. Well, see, I haven't got time to massage your feet in the morning. i got other things to do. And so, like with our kids, you know, I would propose things like, and we have done this, um, but you could say to him, so I can keep you from rolling up five hours of lost TV time, but what I'll do is, uh, and this is up to you, but it's either five hours of lost TV time or at 15 minutes, um, I could come up and with a pan of cold water, I'll just dump it on your head. And then you won't lose five hours, but of course getting up will be m much more sudden and less pleasant. Which would you rather? Lose five hours of TV or a pan of water on your head? Which would you prefer? Now you've given him a choice. And it's amazing, sometimes the kid will actually choose the pan of water on his head because he'd rather not lose five hours of TV time. Of course, then he has to change his sheets too, but you've given him a choice. Kids really prefer to have choices. So I didn't answer your entire question because it was kind of long, but at least you know we're getting there. We're warming up. <coughs> Here's a woman who says, uh, I'm having a hard time forgiving and trusting my husband. <coughs> We've been married for three and a half years, both second marriages. From the beginning of our marriage, my husband has hidden things, lied, kept a woman friend for this whole time, and now I'm finding porn on our computer. Um, we're both uh, Christians. My husband has a way of twisting and blaming and accusing me um, of his behaviors. Uh, I'm not able to trust him and don't respect him much either. Uh, and I'm not perfect. Uh, when he does what he does, I get angry at him and sometimes I say foul words and say that I wish I'd never married him and I yell at him and I scream at him. And I'm sure that goes over very well. Um, my pain has caused me to show an ugly side of me. I come from abuse. I've been cheated on and lied to and, and had other women in my previous husband's life. And to have this repeat in a new marriage has rocked my world. Uh, he's also calling uh, another woman now. And I've gone through three years of phone bills, and he's been calling this woman, and yet he denies it. Um, so he's having an affair with her, at least on the phone, if not more. He's uh, known her for over 12 years and says she's a good friend, <coughs> and yet I've never met her. Um, and... Um, he says he doesn't see her in person, just talks to her on the phone, but it's been one thing after another which breaks the trust in our relationship. He buys and sells stock behind my back. A um, whole bunch of things that he does. So you got a real pattern here in your life, uh, kid. Um, so apparently this has gone on in your previous marriage, and here it is going on again in this marriage. So apparently... Uh, you're not really good at watching and observing whether the people around you are telling the truth uh, and then holding people accountable for their behavior. If you were, you wouldn't attract people like this into your life. Now, I'm not criticizing you. I'm just saying this is something you need to be aware of because if you are good at observing whether people are truthful and if you held people accountable for what they said and did, you wouldn't be attracting two men in a row like this into your life. So what can you do about it? First, you need to understand why he behaves in this way. And, you know, guys don't have affairs and lie and cheat and use porn uh, unless they're feeling empty and alone and miserable and unloved. 
Um, second, uh, once you understand that, you absolutely can't talk to him about his behavior if you're angry. Because if he's feeling unloved and you approach him and you're angry, he will shut down. He won't hear one word you're saying. None. You get angry, all he hears is, I don't love you, and he will shut off. He will either go into the other room and won't listen to you. Uh, he'll immediately lie to you about everything. So you need to sit with him and talk to him and say, look, sweetie, I understand entirely why you would be behaving like you are, which will be not exactly what he's expecting to hear. You need to say, I understand why you would be talking to another woman. I, I understand why you would be using porn. You have felt empty and unloved and alone your whole life long. And there been a, you need to tell him, there have been a whole lot of things that I've done in our marriage that have contributed to that. I've been angry at you. I've screamed at you. I've called you names. I've said that I wished I hadn't married you. Um, I've told you in a hundred different ways that I didn't love you either. So you need to take responsibility for your part in making him feel miserable too. Although I emphasize that I'm not telling you you caused this. I'm not. He came to your marriage long before he knew you feeling empty and alone and miserable and unloved. Long before he knew you. But you're making it worse. Uh, now, how much are you responsible for this? Oh, who cares? Make up a number. 8%. This is, I'm just I'm teasing you here. Who knows what percent? I'm just, but your being angry at him is making it worse. And so you need to take responsibility for that. So you've got to talk to him about this and tell him that you understand. <clears throat> but even though you understand why he's behaving like this, you also have to tell him that it's absolutely essential that this has to also change. And the first step in it changing is that he has to be truthful about it. And you have to tell him that you're willing to accept anything that he tells you um, about what he's doing. Because what he's the truth about what he's doing is the first step in changing it. But he's got to be truthful about where he's using porn and how and how often and what kind of contact he's having with this woman. And he's got to be absolutely accountable. What woman he's talking to and where and how often and where he meets her and if, if this is what it takes to make you feel comfortable, what her phone number is so you can talk to her and so you can cross-reference and confirm that what he's telling you is true. Because it's very likely that he will not be truthful entirely with you in the beginning. Um, and then you continue to love him and you continue to hold him accountable and you monitor his progress. <clears throat> and if he continues to lie to you, and he, and he continues his behavior to be unfaithful to you, then you have to decide whether you're willing to stay in a relationship where somebody lies to you and cheats on you and behaves in the way that he's behaving. But there's no sense complaining about it. You just have to decide, are you willing to live with it and like it, uh, live with it and hate it, uh, or leave it? But I suggest you take these steps uh, and talk to as many people as possible uh, on the uh, conference calls and get as loved as much as you can as you take these steps so that you don't take them by yourself. It's a diff very difficult situation to be <coughs> in a relationship with somebody who is cheating on you and who's a porn addict, it's really difficult. <coughs> Here's somebody who says, uh, is it okay to hold people uh, accountable for what they say and do? What about no expectations? Um, you know, ordinarily, um, when I talk about we don't have a right to <coughs> have expectations of people, we, we don't. 
have a right to expect people to love us. Uh, and that's right, we don't. Um, and she's not, as I make these recommendations about uh, this woman to her husband, she's not demanding that uh, he love her. When they married, however, um, when people marry, they establish a contract in which they exchange mutual promises that they will be faithful to each other. It's a contract. It's an exchange of promises where both people say, I will be sexually faithful to you. And so when I say that to my wife, <coughs> I will be sexually faithful to you. Not 20% faithful to you, 30, 45% faithful. I'll be 100% faithful to you. She has a right to expect that I will. <clears throat> if then I violate that contract on a regular, well, violate it at all, but in this case, the case of this woman, uh, when her husband violates that contract on a regular basis, um, then she has a right to hold him accountable because he's already proven that he's a regular violator of that contract. So she has a right to hold him accountable. Why? to help him to come back into integrity with that contract so that their marriage can be happier and so that, so that he can be a happier human being. So she's not doing this as his jailer. Um, she's doing it for the health of their relationship and so that he can be happier. Can he be happy while he's violating that contract? No, he can't. And he's already proven that he can't uh, keep the contract on his own. So she's helping him do it by holding him accountable. This is different than a consequence. So don't see this as a consequence. Accountability and consequences are different. So he's proven himself to be a chronic pathologic liar. And so what she's doing is holding him accountable for his behavior so that he can stop lying, so he can start telling the truth, so that his behavior can start being correct, so that he can be happier. Do you see the goal? Do you see the difference between that and punishment? It's huge. It's about a difference in attitude. The world doesn't get this. Um, the world would see this about a, a, a wife punishing her husband and saying, okay, now I'm going to monitor what you do. I'm going to monitor um, uh, where you're going because I have to know. No, um, she's going to monitor what he does and, and what uh, he's doing for the health of their relationship and for his own happiness. It's a completely different attitude. <coughs> Because he just has no integrity on his own. So she does have a right to an expectation because of the promise that was exchanged between them. Absolutely does. Ah, here's a young lady. Um, child who wrote me and said this my mother and father fight all the time uh, I love to get letters from kids uh, because it shows that they're kids who are watching the video chat it's just, it's just a riot uh, she said <coughs> it makes me nuts she said I'll be sitting in the living room watching television and they don't even bother to go in the next room they just stand there screaming at each other what are they thinking? It makes me awful. It makes me feel awful. And the language they use. I've read the real love book and I know what kind of effect this is having on me. Is this a riot or what? This is a kid writing this. So what should I do when my parents start fighting? So 
you're very wise to ask this question because what most kids do is simply put up with it. We look at our parents as though they are somehow in a different class, um, as though they are somehow exalted above us and should just know better. Well, very often our parents are spoiled brats and really don't know any better than we do <coughs> and need to be guided. So walk up to them, touch them. This really helps to get their attention. If they're close enough, touch both of them at the same time. But if you can touch one of them, that's very often enough. If you can touch one, then put your hand up like this to get the attention of the other in that sort of universally accepted sign of stop. And then say this. Say, that's, that's after they're looking at you. Because if you do that and get between them, they'll usually stop and look at you like, what in the world are you doing? And then say, what you're doing right now is having a very negative effect on me. I'm not telling you to stop, but I would like to ask, do you really want to continue this? That's all you have to say. And that will usually be sufficiently shocking, if not embarrassing, to bring their argument to a stop. So do that. And then they will usually at least be stunned enough to either carry their conversation into the next room or to at least stop and realize that there being such horses behinds um, that they'll become more loving to each other and be a better example to you when their child can point out that their unloving behavior is hurting their offspring. Yesterday, after returning home from a shopping uh, at a craft store, I discovered my seven-year-old had taken an item from the store. It fell out of his pocket when he took off his coat. When I asked if he'd taken it from the store, at first he denied it. This has happened on a couple of occasions over the years, which would make us ask, why do children steal? Well, you know, curiosity, some, and, but mostly excitement and power. It kind of fills a sense of emptiness that they have. So I decided to go back to the store and have him return it to the store manager and tell him or her that he had taken the item. Good plan, natural consequences, but there's no preparation here, no explanation to the child as to why this is happening, no expression of understanding or input from the child, no teaching. So it's very likely to come across as a punishment. So there's likely to be a fearful reaction from the child at the store. You continue. Upon arriving at the store, my son would not get out of the car, cried hysterically, said he was scared to death. His father told him that they might decide to call the police, which really scared him. You should shoot his father. <laughs> that was not helpful. You need to stick with natural consequences. You just say what you are going to do, not what other people are going to do. My son kept saying that if he returned uh, the item, that they would think he was a thief. Um, and I said, he was right, that's probably what they might think. But on the other hand, they might thank him for taking back the item, for making the right choice in the end. <clears throat> we make a mistake when we try to make people feel better for making the wrong choice. People learn best when they simply experience the natural consequence for their choice. And because that's how life works. You jump off a ledge that's too high, you hurt yourself. That's how people learn. You drive your car too fast around a curve, you, you run off the road. And that's how your son can learn this lesson. So when your son said, they might think that I'm a thief, then the appropriate response would be, but you are a thief, because he was. Um, and, or you might even have said to him, so are you a thief? And let him say, yes. And then what happens to thieves? 
<coughs> and engage in a conversation with him. Well, you know, people don't like being around thieves. They go to prison and so on. But have the conversation with him instead of saying you're going to go to jail. Uh, and then say, so what do you think we could do to prevent all this from happening? Well, the child then can come up with, we could take the item back. Let him come up with the solution instead of imposing it on the kid. Um, and then you go back to the store and you say, so, you know, now let's go in together and you support the kid, but it's so much more helpful when the child participates in the solution. Now, on the off chance that you get there and the child says, I won't go in, you could say, all right, so you wait here. Uh, I'll go in and I'll talk to the store manager and, you know, I'll prepare the way. And then you come out and you say, uh, hey, I've talked to the store manager. You're not going to go to jail. Um, but we still need to go in and you need to have the experience of returning the item without telling him that it's going to be fine. You just say you're not going to go to jail. So that when the kid says, well, but what's going to happen? Well, I don't know. Uh, because the child still needs to experience the uncertainty of, well, what's going to happen? Because it needs to be uncomfortable. He needs to know that it's uncomfortable to do the wrong thing. Uh, the natural consequence has to be uncomfortable. That's what consequences are. Um, and so then he goes in and he returns the item. What if the child absolutely refuses to go back in to the store? Then you do what you do with any consequence. You start to increase the consequences. So you say, well, all right, we can go home, but then we will increase the consequences at home. And you start removing privileges at home. You start making life increasingly difficult at home just as you would do if the child went to prison. Um, and you explain that. You say, what happens to thieves anywhere else? And eventually things become so difficult that you just calmly explain to the child, this is what happens when we make poor choices until the child chooses to go back to the store. But it's all about natural consequences and explaining to the child this is just what happens when we make these choices. But you don't become upset with the child so that he learns from having made the wrong choice and he learns the lesson. And you're there to help him learn the lesson each step of the way without pointing a finger. He learns it as a natural process. So, <clears throat> been delightful. You had you asked wonderful questions, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, a week from today, which will be on the 23rd, just two days before Christmas. Please send us uh, your questions to uh, Greg at reallove.com. Uh, it's been delightful being with you, and between now and then, uh, we encourage you to remember that it's always about. Real love. See you then.